Welcome to the arena where sometimes the hardest part is showing up. My name is Linda McLaughlin. Thank you for being here. I met Steve Emery through one of Seth Godin's Akimbo workshops, specifically the Creatives Workshop. It was a hundred days of daily creative practice. There was a cross section of writers, visual artists, chefs, landscape architects, jewelers, musicians, and photographers, all of us showing up every day to do our work and share it with the others. Steve was incredibly focused, prolific, and generous with his comments. After working alongside each other virtually for almost 170 days, this was our first conversation. Thank you for listening. This is episode 22. Thank you for doing this. I was intrigued when you posted that you wanted to create this challenge for yourself. <laughs> and then, of course, given the subject of my podcast, I thought, oh, gee, this is an opportunity to actually <laughs> nab Stephen and, and talk to him about his work and the very diverse brain that you have. I thank you for all these compliments. <laughs> I've been intrigued about you, your work, and particularly your writing, but also your podcasting. They seem like very different things to invest your time and energy into. The novel seems like a like a totally different process than the one you must have to use when you do your podcasting and podcast editing. Yeah, the podcasting on the one hand is very technical for sure, but it's about telling a story as well. That's true. That's what you've got in common across all of it. When I was going through the big changes, I read and I listened to other people's stories. And eventually something clicks. Someone's way of saying what you need to hear just actually drops into you and you go, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's for me. That's the one. So for me, there is a really big connection between the two of them, even though on the outside, it might not look like there is that storytelling element that is so important to the podcast. But we're here to talk about you. <laughs> so I have a little intro for you. Oh, this will be interesting and embarrassing. <laughs> Well, hopefully it will be interesting and embarrassing. <laughs> Steve Emery, you're a father, son, and brother. Although I don't know if you have brothers and sisters. Are you an One only brother, child? brother, two sisters. There you go. By day, you're a healthcare data support expert with over 20 years experience in the healthcare IT space. But by night, you're a highly skilled and creative visual artist using multiple techniques to tease out a profoundly imaginative world. You've shown yourself to be an intuitive and generous creative collaborator. We recently participated in a workshop where we had the opportunity to work alongside each other, completing more than 100 days of daily creative practice. And over that time, I had the opportunity to watch you and your work transform. And now you've set a new goal of 100 Days of Courage. And I'm going to read some excerpts from a post you made in setting this challenge for yourself. I've realized I need my next 100 day challenge or I will drift. It's like a destination, but better because it's more about process and practice, the daily work. A friend reached out to offer additional accountability around this and thinking about what the friend wrote to me, I realized what I needed was not another challenge to do something I already know how to do. I needed a challenge to attempt every day what I don't know how to do. I need to engage with my fear about my work every day. I need to attempt things I believe are likely to make me wipe out. I'm still not daring enough and failing enough when I attempt things. So my first scary thing is to commit to that 100 days. I'm not looking to stress myself out, just not to coast. I don't want it to be too hard, just hard enough every day to achieve a different relationship with some of the fears. I need to allow myself to ruin things. So finally, I usually stop at a safe distance from the true line of enough, I think because I seldom cross over into too much. Welcome to the arena, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly what I've been trying to do. I had a friend, actually, it's my current boss. My current boss challenged me at one point when I uh, sold him a piece of artwork 
he said to me, this is beautiful. He said, but what I want to see are the ones you never show anybody. <laughs> and I didn't know what he meant. And so I had to think about that. And it, it was a couple of days later when it hit me, what he meant was he wanted to see my wipeouts. He wanted to see the, the cases where I didn't surf all the way to the shore. <laughs> I spectacularly flipped my board in the air and landed on my back in the water. Big splash. And I didn't have any. I had almost no work like that. And that disturbed me. It made me realize, like I said, in the quote that you just read, I'm being too safe. I'm doing what I already know how to do so that I can pretty much ace it every time and get where I know I want to go every time instead of trying to do things where I'm completely uncertain where I'm going to end up or if there's even an end up to get to with the possibility then of, of, of wrecking something or, or, or ruining it. And I never could understand, and this is what I'm grappling with now in the 100 days, I never could understand what exactly it was I was afraid of. Was I afraid of wasting paint? <laughs> you know, we're ruining some paper. I think I was afraid of disappointing myself or not living up to the subject matter. The thing that I was trying to capture, the, the of falling short of it. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to fall short. So I fell short very frequently as a result, just a little bit short, but short every time, not actually getting all the way to the line or over it. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to throw myself at stuff and deliberately follow the things that are the most scary for me. When I realize a particular piece is likely to be one that I'm concerned about or afraid to try, that's when I know that's what I, I need to do in my 100 days. Because it's going to be one that I have some emotion wrapped around it that makes me want to do this very cautiously. And in that case, I really should try to tackle it in an uncautious way and see what happens. I guess in a way, what I'm trying to learn how to do is I'm trying to learn how to wipe out. <laughs> Maybe describe to the listeners the kind of work that you do or what medium you work in. And so they have a sense of, of that. Yeah. So I have two different approaches to my work. My work does not tend to be abstract in the end, but it's often abstract to start with because I have two approaches. One where I know ahead of time what I'm trying to draw, what the subject matter will be. And then I'm usually laying it out standard, what you might expect an artist to do, some sketches and studies and laying it out on the canvas or paper in some fashion, and then going at it with either acrylic, usually for me, pastels or watercolors. Or the other approach is to just begin with a bunch of lines on the paper. I'll often look at something intriguing to me. It could be a fig tree. It could be a, a dinosaur skeleton. And what I'm doing is I'm drawing on the paper while not looking at the paper. My eye is following the contours of the shapes of the object I'm, I'm, that I'm adoring at the moment. And the pen or just moves across the paper. And I just pile up more and more of these blind contour drawings, they're called, until I've got a mess of lines on the page. Lately, I've been painting in sections and negative spaces between those lines until I end up with a lot of shapes. And I gradually do that until I start seeing things in the clouds, imagining things in the shapes. And then that guides me into, oh, this is a painting of this creature, or it's a painting of two people. And so that's where another source, another type of work comes from. So they're either planned or they're completely unplanned. But either way, I have a significant amount of control because I'm very gradually working up the surface and gradually working with these techniques that I've developed over several decades. I'm really very much in control of them. So for me, what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to get to a place where I'm not controlling the medium so well. So that might mean something as simple as working with too big a brush. And now I can't, now I can't keep it in the lines. Or it might mean um, deliberately working with a color that's much stronger than I usually use. Or working with too many colors on the page. Artists often talk about losing control of a painting. And often what they mean is that the composition or the color scheme or something else just got a little too wild, a little too crazy for them. And then they couldn't figure out how to rein it back in or they have to figure out how to rein it back in because what they've done is they've, like I said, they've lost control. I'm looking to get closer to the place of losing control. And actually to me, if I'm not losing control, probably about half the time, I'm probably not close enough to the line. So I'm hearing you talking about it from a technical standpoint. What does it look like when you're going at the work from an emotional standpoint, from the internal world? I think what's going on then is if I'm using one of those emerging images, 
one of the ones that comes out of the lines and out of the abstract forms. I'm pretty quick to fall in love with whatever is showing up on the page. Usually I'm interested in painting it because I have fallen in love with it in some way. I did a piece recently, one of these emerging pieces that turned out to be a very, it looks like a very young girl, probably mid-teens, early teens. She has a fox on her lap and she's thin. Her bones are a little prominent in her shoulders, her elbows, and she has an awkward teenager face turned in profile and and an odd hat that covers most of her face as if she's too shy to get out from underneath the hat. And when the image first emerged, I just realized that I was very much connected to this young woman, this young woman, not sure what the fox in her lap meant, but the image was lovely to me. And as soon as that happens, that I fall in love with the subject, then I have certain hopes for how I'll be able to carry it out, how I'll be able to do it justice. And there's a fear at that point that I won't be able to, or that I'll ruin it in some fashion, I'll lose it. And I think that's often what I'm grappling with as an artist. And for me, there's almost always somebody in the work. I seldom have work that's just like a landscape. That happens more with the pastel sometimes. But lately, there's almost always been some kind of figures or monsters or uh, demons or creatures of some kind that have shown up in the paintings. So I have a relationship almost with them as well. And so that's part of what's going on. But mostly, it's I, I don't want to disappoint myself. I don't want to disappoint this being that's begun to emerge on the page. And so there's a heart relationship, I think, with what's going on. And so that's when it, it gets easy to play it safe, rather than trying to do something a little more bold or a little more daring. And sometimes the work really is asking or demanding something more daring, more difficult. Let me take you back to your growing up years. Okay. What was dinner conversation like in your household? We grew up in a hundred year old farmhouse that my parents had been gradually restoring. It was a thing they loved and wanted to do. And then raised all four of us pretty much there. I was 17 when we left, moved in when I was seven years old. So most of my childhood is in this house. And there's a long table that my parents saved and saved to be able to buy this beautiful old antique table, eight feet long. And us kids were two on each side, mom and dad on the ends. And so dinner was something we had every night together. It was something that was very important to our family. And the conversation was always, what went on with you today? And so it was very child-focused in a lot of ways. I remember my six-year-old youngest sister being able to have just as much an opportunity to talk at that table as any of the rest of us. I remember we had a phrase that we would use with each other when someone was getting too far down a rabbit hole that was not of interest to the rest of us. We, we, it was, the, the phrase was, that's not of general interest. <laughs> <laughs> and anybody could trot that out at any time. <laughs> to say that, oh, time to change the subject to something else. And so it was funny to watch. Mom and dad refereed that table, and we all grew up able to have conversations with pretty much anybody because it was a decent spread of ages. There was not politics discussed at that table or religion or any more adult contentious topics. It was family and kid-oriented. It really was. We had a lot of imaginative play we did outside. We grew up on five acres and surrounded by old farms that were going back to woods. This was the Mid-Hudson Valley of New York. As I mentioned in your intro, you have what one might consider to be a bit of a split personality. You're in the IT area, you're in the operations, in product development, design, implementation, all very systematized area. And you're so disciplined with your art. Were there inspirations from your childhood or your growing up that developed you in such a way? I think math was always something that that our our household had going on. Dad worked for IBM and was an engineering sort himself. He grew up as a tool and die maker at IBM in the apprentice school way back when he was a teenager, and then moved into product, ultimately became a logistical engineer for IBM. I think one of their very first ones, kind of people that uh, produced those just-in-time assembly lines that are now the state of the art, but at the time were relatively new. Dad was designing and and coming up with some of those concepts, uh, assembly lines around the world. Wow. The end of his career. So he was a fascinating man, never went to college. Our generation is the first generation that went to college in my family. So math, engineering, logic, dad was the sort of person that when you did something and said, D dad, what do you think the chances are of that happening? He would say 50, 50, because he was very (laughs) much into the actual math of probability and would explain it to us. 
Does Joke, he, Dad. Yeah, no, right? Exactly. And Dad did have, a, did have a great sense of humor, but but he also was strict about the math. <laughs> so we grow up with that that going on. Most of my family are either engineers or artisans or both. There's dozens of them in my past. Stained glass window artisans, a cellist for the Metropolitan Opera in New York, pianists, painters, several different painters in my background as well as three or four generations of systems engineers and logicians. The two run parallel down the family, and Mm. I don't find them that dissimilar. As I often tell people at work, I'm not really an engineer. I'm an artist who manages to use some of those same skills to solve engineering problems. And that's really what I'm doing. I can picture almost anything in my head. And if I can figure out a way to picture the problem or picture the, the solution to the problem, and I tend to think in grids, matrices, and, and so, so Excel is my second brain, then I can find a way to get it solved. If it requires a more linear kind of engineering thought, like calculus, I find that very difficult. So it just depends on what kind of problem it is. And IT has turned, turned out to be a, an area where my skills work pretty well. What's essential to living a courageous life? I think the most essential piece is wanting it. You can be brave or deal with what's thrown at you without necessarily wanting to. But I think to really lead a courageous life, I think you have to want that at some explicit level. And like I said, I've been much of my life a person who tries to avoid conflict or tension or anxiety. And so I have often done that by just avoiding contentious or difficult situations. And it's been probably the last five years or so when I've really realized no, all the interesting stuff happens, as you said, in the, as you put it, in the arena. Everything interesting happens in the arena. It happens there when you're actually facing down your own fears, when you're facing down a situation hard enough or difficult enough that there is a fearful element. And it's beginning to realize and know that without that spice, it's just not interesting enough. Or you don't have any skin in the game if, if there's not the possibility of losing some skin, getting scraped up, getting banged up. I never did organized sports or found much interest in that. So I don't have that as a model. So for me, it's taken longer, I think, to understand that there's this excitement about tackling something that is the sort of thing you might turn and run from, but instead making yourself turn and face it and then try to figure out what to do different with it. You know, that's not running away and maybe isn't even the most straightforward tackling. Maybe there's a, a different, more jujitsu move you can make. <laughs> And, and drop it on its side with some clever move that uses its own force against it. Or I, I'm frequently looking for that. You don't have the opportunity to even try to figure that out, though, unless you're standing there with a large thing breathing into your face. Like I said, you have to want it. That's, that's what I think is essential. And once you do, you will find the tools, the outlook, the methods that you need to over, overcome your fear first and then begin to use those emotions, and anything else at your disposal to actually solve the problems that are the cause of your fear. I'm constantly asking myself, what's next? So what's next for you? Well, like I said, one thing that's next for me is, is taking my art out for a real walk. I've been reading the, the Toshin book about David Hawkins' life. And I just today at lunch, I got to the section where he's talking about, oh gosh, they did a 10-year retrospective. He'd been painting for 10 years. He was probably 30. And he said, I was petrified to go see all these paintings. I had no idea what they would look like and whether my early work would be, would be embarrassing. Or, And yeah, there were some things that were bad, but mostly it stood up pretty well. He said, the thing is that as an artist, you never have more than about a year's worth of work in the studio. So you don't get any kind of a sense of your progress. And I read that and I was like, huh, <laughs> all my work with a few exceptions, the p- things people have actually you know, reached out to me to buy, all my work is here in the studio. 15 years of work in the studio. And I'm like, that's the problem. I should not have all this work in here. This should mostly be gone. I should have already had it out there. And there should be people that have already bought it all. And it should be all over people's walls. And it's not. So that's what's next. What's next is taking it out for a walk. It's got to go out. It's got to get out there in front of people. The good, the bad, the indifferent, whatever. And the other thing I've learned is that things that I think maybe are, man, that didn't really do what I wanted. Or, or, and that's not that good. Or I don't like that piece. I'm often surprised at the pieces that people find get under their skin and that they come back to me a year or so later and they're like, do you still have that piece? I cannot forget it. I want it. And so I've gotten pretty compassionate with myself and my work that way because I realize just because you don't like it, Steve, doesn't mean somebody else isn't going to. And 
just because you don't think it's as good as you wanted it to be doesn't actually mean it's not good. It just means it didn't meet your personal standard at the time. Give it a chance, put it out there, see what happens. The things people buy frequently surprise me. What has stopped you from pursuing your goals? My goal when I left high school was to become a professional artist, which I never have done. I took a more obvious and safer course for raising a family, earning a living, go into engineering, go into computers, get a job and build from there, which is what I've done for 30 plus years. So that's a dream I have not actually done anything with. And I'm now beginning to embark on actually doing it now. What I'm planning to do is I'm planning to have my next career be that one, the professional artist career. So I'm building a, I'm building a website. I'm building the body of work I need, beginning to think about the contacts I'm going to need to have and create and cultivate and begin to figure out how to make those relationships start now because it takes years to develop into the place where they really start to bear fruit. Meanwhile, I will continue to work for the small startup that I work for because I'm fascinated by that work and committed to it. So I'm going to do these two parallel for a while, but at some point I will make an exit from that. And when I do, that's when I think I will probably finally just jump both feet into trying to make a living as a professional artist and just see what happens. What's kept me from doing it up till now is the the financial insecurity, I think is the thing that really kept me from trying it because it's just, it's difficult to do. I've talked to many professional artists, some of whom are now making a really good living in the middle and, and late parts of their careers. And they talk about how hard the beginning was. Yeah. And I got married early and began having a family early. So it was, it was hard for me to take that chance. I wasn't on my own to take it. But you've continued working on your craft and working on your skill all this time. It's not as though you put your art supplies in the back of the closet and left no. them there. That's right. I actually was blocked for about 20 years and did not paint or draw at all for about 20 years. Ooh. And that's because I couldn't actually complete a project. And so I just stopped trying. And in 2005, on one of our annual mountain vacations, it just all broke loose. And it just all these ideas came to me. I was talking with my kids about them. Our oldest son is also a designer. And we were talking about all of that. And I began blogging about it first and began gradually starting to paint again and it hasn't stopped since. The workshop kicked it all into really high gear. I was making, probably doing a painting every couple of months. Now I'm doing like a painting a week and sometimes several paintings a week. It's just, it's a completely different pace. I, I'm not, I think the workshop created the daily practice. It's that daily practice and daily commitment that is the difference. It sounds like your family has been extremely supportive of your pajama painting, of your maquettes, yep. of your all the various bits and oh, pieces that you're working on. That's right. All the different things that make up my practice. I have a lot of support. What would you do on your last day? Oh, my. My last day would, would have family in it. It would be mostly about mm. family. I would probably, it's funny, I would probably look at everything around me as if I were painting or drawing it but I probably wouldn't actually paint or draw anything. But there's a way of seeing mm -hmm. that is like a caress that I think is what I would mm -hmm. do on my last day. I would be taking my one last long look at everything. And primarily that would be my loved ones, but also just everything around me, the light, the nature around me, the gardens. I'm kind of simple that way. Mm -hmm. I don't have some grandiose you know, plan for the last day. I just want to really soak it up one more, one more day love to borrow your eyes for a day. Just, I think it would be such an incredible experience. Any visual artist, but um, any final thoughts you'd like to share that you haven't already? No, I don't think so. You've done a really good job of drawing out some really interesting things. Anything else about your Critch project? Uh, you're what, day seven? Day seven today. I'm looking forward to when I start getting into truly new things that are scary and in, in, in a different and completely maybe a larger way. That's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping by the end of this, I'm dealing with fear in a more fresh form and I'm dealing with it in, in a larger form that I've grown enough to be able to, to handle it differently. I'm really hoping that by the, as I move further through this, I've begun to change my relationship with fear so that I mm -hmm. don't see it as something that I would run from, but more like something I would run toward. Again, gets back to your arena. The right way to enter the arena is not you know, to come in and then carry around the walls going, where, all right, where's the enemy? 
or where's the other gladiator, right? It's instead, it's to come roaring out with your sword in the air. Where is he? <laughs> Let me at him. And that's more what I'd like to get to. And that's not natural or easy for me, but I believe I can probably shift. So that becomes more like what it's really like, how it really feels. I'm looking forward to following your progress and process and looking forward to having this conversation again in a hundred days or so. Oh, that'll be great. I have, I've really enjoyed talking to you. It's been an, an absolute joy and good luck. Thank you. I'm looking forward to talking to you again. I'll circle back with Steve in a few months. Meanwhile, he's working hard to bust out of his typical 18 by 24 inch frame. He's tackling scale, color, and medium. I wish him an exhilarating journey. I'll put his details along with the details about the Akimbo workshops in the show notes. For anyone who is trying to be more courageous as a creative person, I cannot recommend their workshops more highly. It was also where this podcast was born. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe And if you feel someone else might benefit from listening to this episode, please share it. Leave a rating or review wherever you listen to your podcasts. I invite you to follow my blog, where I continue to explore how to show up more courageously. Visit my website at www.lindamclaughlin.com. Until next time, my name is Linda McLaughlin in The Arena.